Hosts in Jasmine says you guys and this is History of China in a nutshell by channel Blue Jay. <laughs> okay, I guess this is a history video. Is this going to be like uh, you know uh, one of those uh, what the channel name? I forgot the channel's name. The history of Japan, history of the entire world, I guess. Whatever. This is going to be one of those type of videos. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I guess he just uh, just think of a topic and if it feels fun, he make a video about it because his video is usually like you know so. Uh, some fashions that need to be come back or whatever, right? The Olympics video, Sam Monella type of topics, I don't know how to say it. But he's like, fuck it, I'm gonna make a history video about China, or let's watch it. Remember, if you like my Rickson, don't forget to subscribe, so I know which type of videos to react tomorrow. Check out the Rickson, they sell in the season, and yeah, let's watch it. Culturally rich ancient civilization that has survived the test of time and is still around today. Quite a rare achievement not many nations can boast, and thus deserves the attentive studying of its diverse story saturated with the rise and fall of kingdoms and dynasties ever since the Shia dynasty in 2070 BC. So let's get started. The Shia dynasty of China is the first dynasty to be described Archaeological in ancient findings providing a series of 31 dynasties. <laughs> and that's why of the Xing Dynasty. Right, with that all over with, let's focus on modern China. <laughs> of course, I should have seen that coming. Modern China begins with the end of the dynasties. Revolutionaries thought the emperors were not modernizing enough, allowing Western powers to insert their annoying imperial influences in China. The Qing Dynasty was overthrown with the Wu Chang Uprising, when a bomb accidentally exploded and the revolutionaries were like, well shit, they're just gonna blame that on us. I uh, I guess the revolution starts now. Really? <laughs> okay, is that how it happened? An accidentally bomb exploded for whatever reason, they're like, fuck me, it's right, right now or never, is that it? Because yeah, that would happen, clearly they would blame it on them. <clears throat> or maybe Emperor deliberately did that, just so that he, he can clamp down on all these people. For whatever reason. Establishing the Republic of China in 1912. Dr. Sun Yat-sen, a bona fide god to the Chinese, became the first provisional president, although he actually didn't directly participate in the uprising. He was in Denver, Colorado at the time, but hey, he was a leader. Sun Yat-sen struck a deal with General Yuan Shikai, commander of the new army, that if he could get the last emperor of China to renounce his rule, he'll get to be the president. This didn't prove to be a challenge, considering Emperor Puyi was literally six years old at the time. <laughs> hey kid, I'll make you a deal. You can either spend all day ruling over all these losers, being revered as a god amongst men, or you can have this real sick yo-yo. <laughs> so Yuan Shikai became the official president of the <laughs> Republic of China, finally ending 3,000 years of dynasty rule. But that wasn't good enough, and a few years later he pulled in Napoleon and declared himself emperor. Understandably, the Chinese people having just ended an emperor's reign did not find this very cash money, and he abdicated in 1916, dying shortly after, thus beginning Every time some form of uh, public rule, democracy type rule comes along where people have the power, immediately somebody in power, you know what, maybe I can be an emperor. That's why whenever a good democracy starts, there has to be a lot of laws and regulations, right? I mean, that's why in American history, all the founding fathers literally sat down and wrote all these fucking, you know, com uh, you know, amendments and shit like that. How many are there? Like 25 or something? The Warlord Era China shattered into multiple regions, ruled by various warlords. But our hero Sun Yat-sen and the Nationalists haven't given up on a unified China. But he needed help, establishing alliances with the Soviet Union and the Chinese Communist Party. Because hey, what could go wrong with an alliance between two groups of people with fundamentally different ideologies? It worked out totally fine for the Fire Nation and the rest of the world in Avatar The Last Airbender. What? Yeah. Yeah, I'm watching a kid's show, so what? Fuck you. Chiang Kai-shek <laughs> takes control of the Nationalist Party after Sun Yat-sen bites the dust in 1925, working with the Communists who were all like, God, these warlords are annoying. Luckily, we're close to a unified China. Yeah, those warlords are gross. But you wanna know who's really gross? Them commie bastards. Yeah, wait, what? Chang turns on the communists, not resting until he chased all of their armies out of the Nationalist Party, igniting the Chinese Civil War. Both sides trying to- Wait, what's going on up here? Here hey, goes Japan. Chiang Kai-shek almost <laughs> had the communists defeated until they embarked on the famous Long March across treacherous terrain all the way to the northwest, during which they recognized Mao Zedong as their leader. Oh, no, here it comes. With a halo so I don't get wall-banged by a CCP hit squad. 
Anyway, after a tussle over a bridge, we're now at war with the Japanese, leading the nationalists and the communists to set aside their differences and form a united front against them. Then, with the help of the US and allies, they defeated Japan, ending the Second Sino-Japanese War and World War II. They were victorious. They succeeded in ending the long, 14-year, atrocity-filled Japanese occupation of China, their beloved homeland, their ancient, culture-rich civilization, once again finally free from the searing claws of tears. A full-scale civil war breaks out again, with the communists <laughs> oh, accomplishing an incredible comeback fitting for a Rocky movie, routing Chiang Kai-shek and the nationalists to Taiwan in 1949. Scholars debate on exactly how the communists are able to come back, some attribute it to Mao's charismatic ability to persuade peasants and farmers, gathering their support by promising communism would improve their lives and that they'd never, never go hungry again. Now in power of the mainland... I think Mao had many things going for him. His ambitions and his goals were too strong that even today it, it gets followed. And uh, he had internal power because uh, party members, everybody recognized like what his vision is. Right, so many things Mao did that everybody followed, and uh, uh, he had enough power internally, military-wise too, that even people kind of followed. People were kind of like, okay, yeah, we believe that as well, and just yeah, Mao was one of those figures. Mao was uh, one of the major key figures in Chinese history that changed the course. And Mao set on creating a new socialist state the People's Republic of China, mm. declaring that the working class would be leaders of a people's democratic dictatorship. So, yeah, you get to vote. <laughs> Mao promised equal <laughs> rights for women, rent reduction, land distribution, freedoms of thought, person, speech, assembly, publication, association, religion, and much, much more. You know, all the things China is known for today. To go about tackling land distribution, Mao had a little brainstorming session. Sir, how can we conduct a massive overhaul of the land ownership system? <sighs> I suppose, if we must, we will execute a few powerful landlords. Damn it, Jimmy, I'm not happy to do it. But it's for the good of the nation. <laughs> Mao looked around at the world and saw that your nation wasn't really certified dank unless you had a lot of steel output. But instead of taking calculated steps to industrialize over time, Mao wanted it now! Introducing his plan for the Great Leap Forward. Yeah, so get this. How about instead of your usual farming and selling all your extra crop, we keep the you farming part, but we take all your crop for the uh, <coughs> important people. Wait, so uh, we get no food? No, 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 we'll give back whatever's left over. This hardly seems fair. What if I also told you, you're gonna build steel furnaces in your backyards, fueled with, you know, whatever you can get your hands on, maybe your furniture. Wait, what? All in all, the Great Leap Forward was a disaster, resulting in the worst famine in human history. Damn. Of 45 million deaths. But Ooh. hey, numbers don't matter when you're living in a democratic people's dictatorship. Oh, hey, remember that culturally rich aspect of China? Yeah, well, Mao was all like, culturally rich, more like belongs in a ditch. <laughs> Cultures for nerds. With the failure of the Great Leap Forward, Mao wanted to reignite that sweet, sweet revolutionary fever. Bands of millions of students were formed into paramilitary Red Guard groups and were sent on an IRL match of search and destroy. Except instead of an enemy team, they faced civilians, and instead of defusing a bomb, they burned books and relics. These student groups sought to destroy anything considered bourgeois, anything representing capitalism, religion, tradition, and the West. They shut down schools, destroyed religious and cultural artifacts, and killed intellectuals and party elites believed to be anti-revolutionaries. This decade-long revolution left Chinese culture as destroyed as the Star Wars canon after the Disney act. Oh god, that is so fucked up, man. So, all those figures that we hear of how many people Mao killed is basically referring to that part. Greatly forward. Very just like, I don't care about my own civilians, just we need to modernize for now, and he did all that shit. And then he doubled down on, you know, his type of idea, like burn everything, no religion, no nothing, right? <laughs> Holy shit, burning books and, you know, hunting your own people. Acquisition. Fucking bullshit. So, in summary, the Cultural Revolution crippled the Chinese economy, destroyed centuries of culture, and had an estimated death toll of hundreds of thousands to as much as 20 million, with 100 million persecuted. The revolution only ended with Mao Zedong's death, giving him the highest KD in history of 78 million to 1.
Ooh, ooh, ooh. So who's the true gamer here? Deng Xiaoping became paramount leader after Mao, and noticing Singapore's economic boom, introduced some nifty economic reforms. Hey, so things kind of suck around here, so why don't we loosen our grip a smidge with some decollectivization and open some, get this, special economic zones for foreign investment and free market. Yeah, I, I don't know, that, that kind of sounds like capitalism to me. No, 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 we'll call it socialism with Chinese characteristics. And we'll still be the Chinese Communist Party with a bloody chokehold on the masses. Well, okay. We promise it's bloody. In 1989, soon started to go. Hey, for being a people's democratic oh, no. dictatorship, we seem to be missing a lot of that democratic part. Here it comes. Yeah, and whatever happened to all those promised freedoms of speech and press? Yeah, hey, we should like protest. China takes control of Hong Kong from Britain in 1997, and the people rejoiced. From this point onward, the CCP pretty much developed an anxiety disorder and saw everything and anything as a threat. Got a spiritual yoga practice gaining too many followers, ban it, torture them, harvest their organs. Fancy new tech allowing global connection and mass communication? Regulate it, remaster the Great Wall. Hire commentators to spam pro-party ship hosts. Got a pesky Nobel Prize winner spitting fat bars of truth. Arrest him, don't let him speak at his trial, make him die in prison. Current dictate <coughs> president Xi Jinping has become the most powerful Chinese leader since Mao Zedong, yeah. having successfully eliminated those annoying term limits in 2018. Xi's rule of China can basically be perfectly compared to a self-conscious yet egotistical preteen. Wants to be the center of attention, doesn't like to share, probably smells like a Capri Sun. For example, the South China Sea is the resource-rich heart of trade in Southern Asia, but according to the UN, a country can only Alright. <laughs> yeah, but he's not gonna <laughs> go with this law. Like, who, dude, we, don't, we don't agree with this shit law. Yeah, okay. Since even those uh, time periods, since Mao Zedong, like, first it started like with how communism promised things in Russia. Same thing started like, look at the signing communism, right? Everybody's gonna get a law, everybody's gonna, you know, every night's gonna be a party. And it just escalated like it would. But right? he also went a book burning process because fuck it, right? He got his own ambition and just did not give a shit about any people. You know it, it's going to go extremely worse when somebody has that kind of thought. So it just escalated. And then, then another person came. Then Tiananmen Square. Oh, holy shit. Seriously, that, that part is still like China literally. Anybody even mentions something like that, they'll just scrub it and break relations with uh, some country or whatever. Like they're literally saying that this history doesn't exist. This doesn't happen. Even though there are photos of shit, right? I don't know if there are videos, but there are photos of those things. We utilize resources 200 nautical miles from its closest shoreline. But that's not fair, she said. According to this ancient map, we should have all this territory. Oh, you mean those nine vaguely located lines drawn and claimed by the other China nearly a century ago? <laughs> yeah, no, you get 200 miles off your shoreline and that's plenty. Off of our shoreline, you say? So, in an attempt to bypass the system, she decided, fuck it, let's extend our shoreline, and literally created islands throughout the sea, claiming territory overlapping neighboring nations and taking pot shots at foreign fishermen just trying to get some hitsamabushi for dinner. It got to the point where the UN had a trial on whether these islands can be counted as legit, looking at China's process of just dumping seismic fuckloads of sand on coral reefs, easily declaring, uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's not how islands are made. But she, being the lovable bad boy he is, went, true, true, but uh, I'm gonna do it anyway. It has been increasing regional tensions while reaping sea resources ever since. So in conclusion, while China has a very interesting history and amazing contributions to humanity, such as gunpowder, paper, and the first ever live crab vending machine, calling the president Winnie the Pooh or believing in a religion may result in the forceful removal of your organs six out of ten stars. <laughs> Oh god. Yeah, seriously. <laughs> oh god. I didn't know about this China's mid uh, chaotic history like that, but that's just wild, man. Seriously, there was a, you know, a history of China about, you know, that red god thing, right? Uh, I'm pretty sure that's the case when uh, Mao Zedong's people went to uh, obviously book burning and things, but went to several other people, right? I, I'm pretty sure I saw this in Bill Maher or something, where they put a you know dunce cap or something on people's head, right? And if you don't agree with the recent views and do not let go of your past views, right? You have to go through the certain education period, this and that. People were killed, like he said. I'm pretty sure that's the era he was talking about there.
But yeah, this was such a wild, <laughs> wild scenario. And since Mao Zedong, you know, entire China changed in that way, right? Well, leaving all the tradition and all the past things, modernizing in a way, that's just fucked up. But yeah. Alright, well, that was History of China in a nutshell by Channel Blue Jay. If you like my next channel, don't forget to subscribe, and I'll see you next time.